Not too late to say Happy New Year, is it? Certainly not late, I think, to squeeze in one of my favorite resolutions that I saw this week. Uh, thanks, Ed. I like this one. <laughs> yep. Cog's just turning a little bit there. And uh, I quite like this one that I read uh, from somebody who said, I'm, I am so unfit. Running for a train today virtually killed me, so I am definitely making a New Year's resolution. I am never running again. <laughs> I, New, New Year's a good time. Any time's a good time, actually, isn't it? Just to reflect a little bit uh, about where we are, where we're going, how we want to improve our lives and maybe the lives of those around us. But we, I guess the beginning of a uh, term, decade, etc., cetera, is a, is a particular prominent moment where we do that. Andrew kicked us off last week, and if you weren't around last Sunday, I would ask you as members of the church family to, to hear that message, watch that message online. Addressing some goals and some things around vision and dreams, big things for us as a church family here as a local family, but also for us as individuals, as followers of Jesus. And God has a lot to say about how we succeed in life, doesn't he? Let's just make that really obvious point. He has an awful lot to say about that. So any kind of improvement that we want to make starts with the acknowledgement that he knows best and that he loves us most. So any kind of doing better in life, whatever, you, whether you call them resolutions or wh whatever, I don't really mind, starts with acknowledging him. He wants to bless us. He wants to show us his love. He wants to be powerful in our lives. So there's a bunch of things that he does on his side of that relationship equation. Amazingly, it's an unequal uh, relationship, isn't it? He does so much by way of wanting to encourage and bless and show his love. And then there are some things on our side of the equation that contribute to that that help our hearts to be more healthy and therefore our lives to be more healthy and therefore to, be, to improve, if you like, to get better, to succeed in life. But they're all linked to how we're designed to be and to function. And some of those things that are on our side, our contribution to this, well, there's so many of them, aren't there? And Andrew put up a list, um, again, we'll just see that briefly last week, a little bit of a reminder, it frames some of where we're at. Catalyst for spiritual growth is the title. But in other words, how, how do I grow? How do I improve? How do things get better for me and then through me for the world that I can then influence? Really, really important. There's five important things there. I'm going to focus in on the middle one a little bit today and then in the next couple of weeks as we continue to dip into the book of Daniel as a kind of launching pad for some of these things. That middle one there talks about personal, healthy, spiritual habits. Not new language for us, but again, let's just acknowledge God says there's a bunch of things that you can do. I really encourage you to do these things because they will help life to go better for you because they help to improve the way that we relate to each other and then that you relate to other people in the world. So it helps if you pray. It helps if you worship. It really helps if you forgive others and don't harbor resentments. It really helps if you take time out alone to be with me and then with other people. It really helps if you take one day in seven where you stop working. That appears in the same list as don't kill people. So it matters, <laughs> says God. Word to the wise. Well, there's a healthy habit, and, and uh, I think you know where we're going with this, because Nikki teed us up earlier that we're going to have a look. I'm wondering whether it featured on anybody's New Year's resolutions uh, this year. But we're going to dip into the habit of fasting, the practice of fasting. And I know you're so excited about that. I can just tell the, the enthusiasm in the room for that, uh, as the roast beef is already in the oven and you're looking forward to lunch. And this isn't, hear carefully, we, 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 time is relatively short, we're going to skate over some things. This isn't a do more, try harder kind of a message, although there's no hiding from the fact that one of the outputs of a message like this is do it, <laughs> fast, God encourages it, right? But it's not a do more, try harder, you're not very good, so try harder. God really wants to encourage us all of the time, all of the time he wants to do that, to encourage us. But that means paying attention, isn't it, to some of the things that he says. And like any good parent, encouragement doesn't always sit comfortably. It doesn't mean that God just wants to stroke us gently and affirm us and make us feel good about who we are. Sometimes encouragement comes with a little bit of a sharp edge, and maybe that's true about this topic. I read this week a story about a woman a couple of years ago. She began this habit of fasting, and we'll explore it in a moment. She gave up food one day a week for nine weeks because she'd felt led to pray for nine particular things 
across that, that time period. And she said some interesting things afterwards. She said, God moved in many ways during that time. And whilst actually most of the specific answers to my prayers didn't appear during those nine weeks, very realistic thing to say. This isn't some kind of slot machine transactional thing. God did increase my faith that they would come. And within a year of that first fast, my lost friend came to faith in Jesus, another friend who was, uh, was delivered from a long-standing addiction, a couple whose marriage was floundering are still together and doing okay, uh, my unmarried friend is still single, but, I'm enjoying, uh, but I see her enjoying a new peace. And she said this, I learned that fasting isn't a guarantee that every request is going to be answered, though I found that it helped me to pray with more energy. The most important result for me of my first fasting of beginning to develop this habit was that I felt more in love with my Lord and Savior, Jesus, and more hungry for more of him. Circumstances were indeed changed in some cases, but more importantly, I was changed. And then this, it's the thing that Andrew saw on my tweet feed yesterday. Dieting, she said, changes the way you look, but fasting changes the way you see. Because it reveals, she went on to say, something about hunger. Fasting is clearly linked to appetite and hunger and desires and longings, which is why it is so foundational to, to, to the way that we are and the way that we grow. That was one person's experience. It won't be everybody's. There'll be people in the room who have some familiarity with this, of course, and others with none. We need to take our lead from the Bible, not just other people's experiences. It's interesting the Bible actually has lots of things to say about fasting. Of course it does. But it doesn't have a neat passage which says, okay, here's what it is. Here's how it works. Here's why it's great. Here's how you do it. And it's kind of a neat thing that you can then preach from. There's a bunch of examples and a lot of assumptions made in the Bible about what that might be. So a quick what, why, how. What is it? Why do we do it? How, how might we go about it? Just a few things. Uh, Martin lloyd Joe says this, fasting is voluntarily going without food or any other regularly enjoyed good gift from God for the sake of some particular spiritual purpose. All bits of that sentence matter. John Piper, another writer, says something similar. It's a, it's a temporary renunciation, giving up something that is itself good, like food, in order to intensify our expression of need, there's that desire, hunger, longing word again, for something greater, namely God and his work in our lives. Scripture talks about all kinds of fasting, personal, public, private, congregational, regular, for ourselves, for others, a whole bunch of different things. I found a way of saying it slightly differently. Fasting is a way of saying with our stomach how much we need and want more of Jesus. Take your pick, create your own definition if you like, as long as it's kind of within the, a biblical framework. Daniel uh, then ha has some things to say, and others too. We're not going to go deeply into the scriptures. We're going to flit across some. But in Daniel, um, there are at least three occasions where he could be said to be fasting, although that word is only applied to one of them. You might remember from last week, we read chapter one, where he refuses to eat the Babylonian king's fine food and, and, and the sort of fine dining of the kingdom of Babylon right there. And he keeps to his vegan alternative. Why? As a way of keeping himself dedicated to God in that environment. He, as a, a man of God's kingdom, as it were, doesn't want to be seduced into uh, a worldly culture. Daniel 9, I prayed and I fasted. Uh, he says, in response to a revelation that the city of, of Jerusalem, his home city, was going to suffer for a further 70 years. I, I fasted about that, he says. Then chapter 10, next chapter, he receives a vision. And in order to gain understanding about this vision from God, he fasts. He says he fasts for, for three weeks. Again, it's what we might call a partial fast. It says, he, uh, I think the, the, the verse is on the screen, I ate no choice food, no meat, no wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. That's an interesting addition, a hygiene-related uh, addition to the way that we might understand fasting. I think my boys have probably participated in that particular <laughs> fasting, although unintentionally maybe over the years. A couple of things it's not. Fasting's not dieting. All right? It's not dieting. Dieting may be good and may have all kinds of other health benefits, but they're not the same thing. Fasting isn't just skipping a few meals accidentally or because you've got a really busy day and then looking back and calling it fasting. <laughs> There's no such thing as fasting between your regular meals. <laughs> fasting isn't a hunger strike. 
to get something from God. I'm going to keep going without food until God does something. No, it's not that. It's not aimless. There needs to be a purpose, a reason. That's why in those quotes earlier, without a spiritual purpose, it's actually not Christian fasting. It's just going hungry. And it's not certainly not about self-promotion. Of course it's not. There's a danger in all of these things that they become religious or they become X, Y, Z or, or that they're a, a kind of a source of pride or showing off or, or whatever, making myself feel better. So what then? What benefits? What, what reward? What reason for fasting? Incredibly countercultural, by the way, isn't it? The idea of abstaining from something, giving up something good voluntarily, very countercultural. Actually, very counter to our, our natural appetites as well. Going hungry on purpose, really? Why? It sounds very negative. Well, it's not negative, but friends, it is a sacrifice. We've got to understand that. It is a sacrifice on purpose. That's part of the whole point. It costs. It's not easy. We don't like it. We're not supposed to enjoy it particularly. If you do, that's strange. <laughs> but in the Bible, what happens to sacrifices? Often fire falls on sacrifices, as it were, physically, metaphorically, the image of fire falling on a sacrifice, that speaks of something of God's affirmation, of God's power falling on this offering from weak people. That's what a sacrifice is, isn't it? And being attracted to that. So, guess why we don't like to do it? Guess why fasting is particularly unappealing? Because the world, the flesh, and the enemy conspire to... Lead us away from it precisely because there is power here. This is an encouragement from God. It's a God-given practice and encouragement. Anything that God gives, by definition, is going to be good for us and through us, for others, for his world. It's part of his design. So if it's good and it's from God, there's a bunch of opposition to that. I don't probably need to express some of the, the kind of reasons slash excuses slash thinking that goes through our head when we, when we think about a practice like fasting, or maybe specifically fasting, because it seems to carry, sit in a particular place in, our, in, in the possibilities. But stuff about, well, I, I, I don't want to go hungry, just being honest, and, these are all, and I've been through all of these, right? Uh, and so you've been through a few of them. I don't want to be hungry. My metabolism isn't conducive to fasting. So I need to choose a different discipline. Okay. I've tried and I've failed so often, I feel so guilty. I'm not going to try again. I've been there. I'm going to pick one of the other disciplines instead to balance out my lack of fasting with more of the other stuff. Okay, good luck. I get faint if I don't eat regularly. Sure. Well, if you have medical reasons, by the way, for, for abstaining from food, like pregnancy and, and um, particular forms of diabetes and so on, sure, take, take medical advice. Hear that? There it is. It's on the tape. Uh, I've skipped a couple of breakfasts and called it fasting. No, I'll start next week, next month, next year, next decade, next century. Means never, doesn't it? Um, what else? Oh, I do, I'm not going to read my emails for three weeks. That's going to be my form of fasting. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. This is stuff that we really, really like that we're giving up, not stuff that we don't necessarily like, blah, blah, blah. Again, let's not make up our answers based on our experiences or somebody else's. Uh, the Bible has plenty to say, it, it, but it seems to be this. Fasting is like an amplifier on our longings, on our prayers and our desires. I might say it this way. Fasting is like expressing your longing for God. Imagine writing it. Expressing your longing for God or for his power to act in a particular way, whatever that way is, a particular purpose, remember, and then clicking, as you've written it down, clicking bold, clicking underline, clicking italics, and then adding a whacking great exclamation mark at the end of it. That seems to be a summary of kind of what fasting does, how it behaves and acts. Kind of goes hand in hand. John Piper says it's, fasting is the handmaiden to faith and prayer. They seem to kind of go, go together. And, and the fasting is a particular way of intensifying what we're doing when we're praying, asking, and so on. Famously in Mark 9, some of you may remember this, there's the boy who's depressed, oppressed demonically, and the disciples can't do anything about it, and they say, why not? And Jesus says, this kind of oppression is only dealt with by prayer and fasting. Strong implication, there's some extra intensity kind of required here. Again, it's not a neat transaction, there's no neat equation here going on. 
just drawing some principles from Scripture. Is it a matter of obedience? Do we have to follow? Is it commanded? Because if God says do it, then it's, it becomes a matter of obedience for us. Well, actually, no, in the, in the Bible, I can't find a place where it says you must fast, but Jesus expects it. Nikki reminded us of that earlier on. He doesn't say if you fast, he says when you fast. He talks about feasting for a while, if you're thinking of that passage in Matthew, when the bridegroom is around, when I'm around, it's a time of feasting, but when I'm gone, which he has from the earth, then you will fast. The verses on the screen there from Matthew. So there's the assumption of Jesus that we will fast, and loads of mentions of it in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. I looked at about 25 references. I tried to group them roughly. It seems to me that in the Old Testament especially, there's a couple of focuses of fasting. One is, is kind of, we might say, inward, and it's around repentance. It's around, I've got this so badly wrong, or we have got this so badly wrong. I need to express that sorrow in fasting as well as in, in prayer. A bunch of references which I, I don't have, have time for a kind of inward thing. There's an outward thing, again, quite often in the Old Testament, which is around grieving. So some circumstances have happened. Uh, Happens in uh, in David's life quite a bit, um, in Samuel's life, Ezra as well. Some some tragedy happens, and and so it's not about me having messed up, but it's about there's awful stuff going on in the world. And the response to that is to grieve and add fasting to uh, prayer. There's no indication of that particular thing in the New Testament, but I see no reason why that, that, that couldn't continue to happen. By the way, um, amazing to read of Abraham Lincoln proclaiming a national day of fasting uh, in his nation uh, and other historical examples of the same thing. I cannot help but add at this moment in our own nation, would it not be remarkable? Could we perhaps pray even for this, that our amazing monarch who knows the love of God he has a relationship with Jesus, might, before she ceases to be our monarch, call a national day of prayer and fasting in our nation. And for, for those similar reasons, an inward kind of repentance for where we've got to, and an outward kind of grieving at the state of society and the world, would be one of my, 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 my deep prayers. Fasting often gives uh, voice, then, to the pain and sorrow of those things. But so much of fasting, and the way we tend to associate it biblically and, and now, is, is what, I, what I might call forward So there's an inward, an outward, and then there's a forward. As in, God, would you do something? Would you act? A longing for you to do something. The attention of fasting is always Godward in all of them, by the way. It's not us or the circumstances. It's it's Godward, always. The the focus is there. But for what? For favor, for breakthrough, for guidance, for resources, for healing, for God's power to be made evident in some particular crisis or way for some reason, for peace, for discernment, for comfort, for wisdom. As you look at that list, does any of that resonate with your longings and your desires? Of course it does. Of course it does. Am I saying we fast every day for all of these things? No, there's something that seems to be Uh, particular about fasting that is, sure, regular or one-off, whereas prayer might be continual. But as an intensifier to those things, we find examples of all of those things in the Scriptures. Again, forgive me, I'm not going to to run through uh, all of those references, but a whole bunch of them. Pick any of those words that I've just mentioned, and I'll find you a place in the Scriptures where fasting has been part of the response of the people of God or the person of God crying out for God's favor, breakthrough, healing, power, miracle, discernment, peace, direction, guidance, again and again and again and again, not least in the book of Daniel that I've already quoted, but in so many other places as well. Esther, Ezra, beautiful examples. Why don't you do the same thing that I did this week and just do a little word search on fasting. There you are. That'll mean you do the work and uh, we can compare notes later on. Read a brilliant example, too, just from um, history. Uh, and again, it's not to say you fast, you get this result. 
but uh, th there was a plague of locusts in Minnesota in the 18th century, at the end of the 19th century, and locusts absolutely wipe out everything. For five years in a row, they wiped out the entire crop in a huge area of Minnesota. And then a, governor, a new governor of the, of the state arrived called John Pillsbury, and the first thing he did was to say, right, the, you've tried all kinds of ways of getting rid of these locusts and the eggs that they lay and all of that. And he declared that they would fast for three weeks, and they fasted for three weeks. And two months later, mysteriously, nobody knows why it happened, all of those locusts left. It's a species, by the way, that is now extinct, apparently. That's not to say, please hear, that it, it always works out like that. But there's power in fasting. There's power here. We ignore it at our peril. Above all, above all those things that I've mentioned along the why, why, what might be the reasons that we would engage in this activity, comes this one. And it kind of expresses and summarizes all of them, but it's above them all as well. It expresses a longing for more of God himself. A hunger and an appetite for more of God, not just his activity in his world. As good as that is, as important as that, as that is, answers to prayer, the intensifier to prayer, if you like, the underlining bold italic exclamation part, God, do this. But one of the biggest do this is, is God, I need more of you. I want more of you. I must have more of you. I need more of your presence in my life. A bigger appetite, a greater passion. We've been singing, I love that Fee chose songs about, around passion for God. So important. Fasting connects us with our appetites. It reveals something about our appetites. Sure, in a slightly painful way. Because it presses on a particular appetite. I'm talking about food. And by the way, of the 25 examples in the Bible, pretty much 24, 25 of them are about food. So sure, pick other things to, to fast, absolutely, that you enjoy regularly and, and is, is costly to give them up for a season. But friends, I'm going to go, food is generally where it's at. Because it's pretty uncomfortable for, for most of us, or all of us actually, to give up food. As we become conscious of hunger pains, the discomfort of going without food or whatever it is that you've given up. Such a powerful reminder or, or a catalyst in my experience for revealing uh, or, or becoming more aware of the level of my hunger, my desire for more hunger for God. Fast, somebody said this, fasting says with our whole body what prayer says with the heart. I long to be satisfied in God alone. I'm not going to share very much of my own experience uh, because... The idea is that we keep this relatively private, unless there are good reasons not to. But in terms of this word, it seems appropriate to say I fasted myself in a whole variety of different ways over the years, have developed, because it's something that you want to grow in, and, and so on. And so for different reasons, in different sorts of ways, you can get creative with it. I'll, I'll tell you one thing, though, from last year, because it relates to hunger. Uh, for a 30-day period last year, I, I fasted from a little bit like a Daniel thing, from all the things that I like, basically, uh, and only ate once a day. Because my experience is that when I fast for a longer period of time, the time when I'm most hungry physically is at the end of day one. Subsequent days seem to be less physically hungry for me. It may work differently for you. But at the end of day one, I'm at my most hungry. I most want to give up at that point. I most want to dive into the fridge or the rest or just do something, present that excuse to God or whatever it is. So I'm most hungry then. So deliberately, I, I chose for 30 days to have one meal a day at the point, therefore, where I was most hungry every day. And it wasn't pleasant because it's not supposed to be pleasant. But the point being, for a particular reason, remember our definition of fasting? It's renouncing something that you like, you do regularly, but for a particular spiritual reason. And I so wanted, was in touch with a, a desire to be more hungry, that I kind of focused in on making the hunger worse, if that makes sense. That, please I, hear that in the spirit in which it's intended to be given. It'll work out differently for you. A couple of practical points uh, for anybody. And again, there's so much help on this. There's help on the bookstore, by the way. There's help on the Walking With God website on, in, on, on the Trinity site and a whole bunch of other places. John Piper is very good on this stuff. Four, four quick things on practicals, and then we're going to pray. Decide what you're fasting for. It does help focus. Without that sense of purpose, why am I doing this? Actually, I'm not sure that it's Christian fasting. I think it's just going hungry. Two, start small, especially if it's new to you. If you've never engaged with this practice, there's no shame in that. There's no guilt trip here at all, ever, from the Lord. But start small if it's new. Or, or if it's not new, what's the next thing that you might kind of grow towards? Make a plan. There's no rules, but we need a plan. So if you are fasting from solid food, maybe target a time in the week where you'll miss two or three meals in a row. 
Maybe that's a place to start. You can miss those two or three meals in a row. That's what I'm planning to do. Maybe you work towards that being a regular pattern or a monthly pattern. Or maybe you work towards sometimes going for a longer number of, of days uh, than that. If it's not food that you're fasting, uh, or, or if you're fasting in a limited way, a partial way, like Daniel, frankly. He's on a kind of vegan diet. He hadn't given up food altogether. He just was avoiding things that he w were nice. <laughs> Um, so, so maybe uh, you go for a longer period with that stuff, because hunger works differently. If it's not food, but it's something that you enjoy, social media, brilliant thing to fast, totally addictive. I think it was, there's a survey in the States this week, 62% of younger people would say, I, I know that I'm addicted to my phone, and usually that means to social media. Um, so social media fast, really good. TV, um, Paul actually talks about abstaining from sex. I'll just leave that hanging right there. 1 Corinthians 7, for those of you who are married. So start small, make a plan. Uh, plan what you'll do instead of eating. There may be some time savings, inverted commas. There may be some money savings. What are you going to do with that time, that money? Be intentional about that. Link it to your purpose in fasting. Finally, be sensitive to others. Most fasting is clearly pr personal and private and not something that we tell others about at all. But uh, rocking up to a party, that you, a dinner party or something you've been invited to, and just announcing, well, actually, I'm not eating, is just a bit rude. So um, think, think about that a little bit. Let's wind this up. <clears throat> Fasting matters. It does really matter. It's not a command. But I think if we put it in the category of optional extra, we're, we're missing out. I think if we put it in the category of that's for super Christians, that's for kind of those kind of category of people. I'm not in that category of people. I'm in this category of people. We're missing out. We're certainly being unbiblical. There is no suggestion that fasting is for some followers of Jesus and not others. He says it's a healthy habit. Healthy habit for walking with God, for growing in him, for improving our lives. It's one of those healthy practices to work in alongside others. It's highly countercultural, especially in a very consumerist world. But the kingdom of God is pretty countercultural. The enemy has an interest in magnifying the cost of it, what we would be missing out on. Because the enemy always has a cost in magnifying those things and minimizing uh, anything that's good and from God. And the heart of fasting is about longing. Right at the root of it, ultimately, it's about longing. It, it gets in touch, us in touch with desire and ache, literally and where that is directed, and how healthily that ache and that longing is directed. We're putting our stomach where our heart is to give added intensity to our ache. Our ache for breakthrough, our ache for that marriage which is not going well, our ache for a loved one who's sick, our ache for uh, a job, our ache for a, in the face of a national crisis, an ache for more of God's power, for more of his provision, for more of his presence. Fasting takes that deepest prayer that, that we have and it puts, puts it in bold font and it puts it in italics and it puts it in underlined and it whacks a great exclamation mark at the end of it. And perhaps above all, fasting is that physical way of clearing a bit of other stuff out of the way to recognize and intensify our heart's cry that says, we need you, Lord. I want more of you, Lord. So come. Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Why don't you just take a moment, it might help to have eyes closed, it seems to be one way of keeping out some distractions. You might be having a little conversation with God, I'd encourage for that to be more listening than speaking, but acknowledge what some of your thoughts are. Then we're just going to pray, we're going to ask the Lord to specifically show us anything that we might want to respond to. There's been one or two words given already this morning. Always create space to respond. Let's just have some silence. So as I say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit of God. And speak to us and communicate to us and do your underlining in our hearts. We pray now.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father, that everything that you communicate to us is good. Thank you that we can know that if it's, if it's not good, it's not you. I feel God just rem- reminding me to say that the goal is not fasting. The goal is God. The goal is not fasting. That's, that's a puny goal. The goal, the goal is God. The goal is Him. The goal is more of Him. I, I, I just sent so much this morning, even as we were worshiping earlier as well, just so much serious engagement with this, with, with what we want for ourselves and each other and our world as we, as we survey it at the beginning of this new year. So thank you, Father. Thank you for helping us engage intentionally and purposefully. And we recognize, we just want to recognize, God, our weakness in that how easily we're distracted, how quickly we might want to move on from a serious intention to something else. Father, we, we confess that, we recognize it, but Lord, we are, I praise you so much that you love us in our weakness. You welcome vulnerability. So we're so grateful for that, Lord, and we take assurance from that. And in the context of you loving us, whatever, God, we're asking that you'd bless us with your grace. You'd bless us with a sharper appetite. You'd bless us to step into things that may be uncomfortable as part of your good gift to us, but serve a greater purpose. We pray, Father, that generally where we're looking to make things better, where we're looking to improve our lives, Lord, we would never want to look anywhere other than your best purposes for us. So would you bless us in that too, in that endeavor as we do that for ourselves, as we share it in our groups and with one another, as we pray and encourage and take a hold of everything that you've given for us to make changes that lead to walking with you, walking with you Lord, more closely, more intimately on our side of that equation. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. But we say more of you, Lord, more of you, more of you. In our weakness, more of your strength. In our stupidity, more of your wisdom. Thank you. In our compromised appetites, Lord, greater focus and sharpness. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. So moments to respond physically. Fasting is a physical response. We invite a physical response in this place. Please don't sort of switch off at this moment. There's still time before kids need collecting. A physical response is to come to the front, not because it's special, but because it's a signal of something, of an intention, of a longing. Uh, And so many good things happen when we get prayed for by others. So so just come. If you know that you want to respond in this, in a general way, you know that God is calling you. God is on your case. You want to express that in some way. I'm just going to invite you now as the band play quietly to come forward. Just, just make your way. Just come. Some people will, will, will pray for you. Again, if you're new to this, you don't have to explain anything. It's not magic. It's just the way that God... It's, a, it's another beautiful practice that God gives us, right? Where we put a hand on a shoulder, men to men, women to women, and we say, thank you, Lord. And he might speak to you, give you something. So just come if you already know. But I'm going to, I'm going to speak out a few things And if these apply to you, it's because God loves you and he wants you to respond. And the way we're responding this morning is to come forward. It's to walk from where you are from the balconies to step forward into this space. I'm encouraging you to do that. Something around hunger, for sure. Appetites. You recognize distorted appetite, whatever that might look like. That was the phrase I had, a distorted appetite. You just want to to realign appetites with, with God's best for you. That sense of being vulnerable, weak, you might express it as being afraid, stressed, scared, unsure, maybe a bunch of other things. Those were the the senses that we had as we prayed. If those apply to you, that makes you vulnerable right now. You feel that. This word this morning speaks into God's provision for us as we recognize our weakness. It speaks into his 
uh, strength and grace to meet us at that place of need and to, to do good things. So if that's you, please come. You, re- you recognize those things, uncertainty, confusion, vulnerability, stress. Just come. Those who are praying for church family, come and pray. Please come and pray. Maybe you're already fasting for something. Maybe you have been for a while. You've been calling out to God. You're connecting your heart to a, to a crisis, to a, a deeply held request for breakthrough. Could be in the nation. Love, I'd love us to be that church that is on our knees for our nation. Express that this morning. More of you, Jesus. We say more of you. We say more of you. More of you, more of you, more of you. If you don't know what to pray right now, and you're not sure you, 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 you want to pray something for yourself, pray for the person next to you. Pray for those folk up here. We still need some folks to come and pray for them, by the way, so come. But just say more of you, God. I need more of you. We need more of you. This nation needs more of you. Connect us with your plan. Connect us with your presence. Connect us with your power. Connect us with who you are. More deeply, more profoundly. Forgive us for ever trying to find solutions anywhere else. Will had a picture of uh, long grass that needed mowing, and it was a very unappealing thing. You know what it's like in winter. You look at the grass. Oh, I don't want to mow the grass. It's too long. He just had the strong sense of this unappealing thing is important to engage with. Just like grass actually in the end does need cutting, and it benefits from it. Stepping into that uncomfortable thing. That may not be fast yet, maybe something else. Maybe addressing something that you've put off. Speak breakthrough in Jesus' name. Breakthrough in Jesus' name. The last particular word we had was uh, for those who are too easily satisfied. Again, don't hear any con- condemnation in that, but too easily satisfied is the word from the Lord. I'm too easily satisfied. More of you, Jesus. More of you, Lord.